This week on Technado, we've got more cities hit by ransomware, cellular networks gone wild, and an interview with John Dixon from the Denim Group. Don't go anywhere because Technado starts now. Welcome, everybody, to Technado and what is likely to be a very special episode because, uh, you know, I'm here, your host, Don Pizzette, uh, in studio with Justin Dennison. Justin, excellent having you. <laughs> and uh, and what's going to make this an exceptional episode is the fact that Mr. Peter is on vacation. Yeah, so he's not here. So I don't I don't I don't know what we're going to do. Yeah. Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to drop all our marketing jargon. <laughs> mm, oh, yeah. He's not here to keep us in line. This is going to be streamlined. That's right. So uh, so we're going to have some fun here. we got a lot of great news articles here to get through. So let's uh, let's just dive right into it. Uh, you know, our first one, I, I got a big kick out of this one. This is from datacenterdynamics.com. Verizon BGP route leak causes Cloudflare customer outages, AWS issues. Um uh, I, uh, I kind of chuckled when I saw this headline because normally it's, you know, Chinese ISP routes world traffic through Great Firewall China or something like that. Uh, but BGP is a super trusting protocol. It's easy to make mistakes. Uh, and this time it was Verizon that did it, causing several networks to be routed to the wrong place, causing some outages. Uh, Cloudflare is always affected because they're spread across so many different networks. But this one got a bit of AWS also. Uh, so it's not just China. We're capable of screwing up the Internet, too. So, Don, I, I, I talked to Ronnie a little bit about this, and I, I'm not a networking person you know, as far as good. The fact that it leaks, what does that mean? Like the BGP route leaked. Sure. Like how does that affect things? So BGP, the, the Border Gateway Protocol, um, it is, it's what's used to route the Internet, and it's a very old protocol and a very basic protocol. And one of its biggest uh, limitations is it does not support redundancy at all. That it's just not built in. It's not capable for BGP to have two routes to the same place. So it picks one route, and then it sends that out. And if you think about it, I mean, there's there's a million routes, or more than a million routes, I think, uh, that are in this thing. And if you are, are dealing with that many routes and you have redundant routes too, that, that doubles your table size or it gets even bigger. So they just push the primary route. Well, the other routes do exist, and the other ISPs have to know about it because what they're doing is they're watching for a failure so they can then publish out and say, oh, I'm now the next best route, so you can get there this way. Well, they're supposed to suppress those advertisements unless there's an outage to send them out, and if they screw up, they can send out the advertisements. Now, normally, the next ISP in line should block the advertisement if it's like if it's just me saying, oh, I've got the Pentagon's network right here in, in our building. The next ISP is going to say, no, you don't, and stop that, right? But if it's a true redundant route, and I say, hey, you know, I, I've got the, the network right here, the next ISP in line is going to say, well, yeah, you know, you're a, a legit person, and I'm going to allow that to be advertised out. So now it leaks out when it shouldn't. And the effect is normally one of two things. Either one, uh, some traffic goes to the wrong place and some traffic goes to the right place. So then you get erratic behavior. Some people get to the site, some people don't. Uh, or all traffic goes to the other route, which is a legit route. But then the return traffic will be returning the other way. Things get lost. And then usually nobody gets to the site at that point. So that, that's what typically happens. And it all comes back to BGP just being super basic. Well, that helped me understand a little better. And uh, that's bad, right? That's sort of those really frustrating things. It seems like the erratic behavior could be definitely an iffy thing to figure out. It sounds like a Heisen bug to me. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> it's, uh, it's a problem that they didn't think of back in the 1980s. And, and even if they had with the hardware that was capable of powering routers and stuff, I, I don't know they could have done a better job back then. Uh, how you fix it? Like, this is what powers the internet. So you would be talking about an entire overhaul of routes across the world. That's a difficult thing to do. So, uh, you know, they've, they've been working on different solutions, but we'll continue to see little leaks like these pop up. Uh, and I say little, you know, because they just affect a few million people. And, <laughs> and so that's just a, a part, of, uh, part of the Internet right now. Well, I'll, I'll make sure that none of my routes leak. I, I don't actually <laughs> have anything. Uh, so there we go. Yeah, but Most of us have no control. Uh, yeah, system. we just, just go, oh, I can't get to that site. There we go. Yep, and we complain like ah, you know, and we don't we don't blame Verizon. We're just like ah, oh, Amazon sucks or Cloudflare's <laughs> down again. And it's not even their fault. 
Uh, you know, speaking of Amazon, they had a, a new announcement this week on their blog. So I've got the AWS News blog pulled up here. Uh, new UDP load balancing for the network load balancer has been released. Uh, you know, Justin, you and I filmed the cloud training for HBO TV, and, and we covered uh, elastic load balancers or what are now just network load balancers. And one of the things we taught, so now we have to go and update all our content, is that you could only do HTTP, HTTPS, and standard TCP ports, right? And and that was it if you were load balancing. So they rolled out UDP, which is a pretty cool feature to have. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking, when would I use this from a developer bent? Uh, I guess if I had a very large distributed set of like services inside and I needed crazy high throughput, we I've used UDP for talking between things where I don't really care if, oops, I, I missed this. It'll just, uh, I have a queue that's fixing this or I get to retry. Um, you know, I, I didn't really think of it. And then it came up and I was like, oh, that would be handy if you really needed to turn up the wick on something. Yeah, you know, um, if you have highly redundant syslog servers, you know, that, that's flowing over UDP. Uh, I use UDP for heartbeats sometimes for testing machines to see if they're alive. You know, I don't necessarily need responses to those. And uh, and so those can now pass through a load balancer. So there's a few different use cases. I don't know how in demand this was. Like, I never I never complained about it. Like, oh, I can't do UDP. It just, that was it. But, uh, but they have that feature now. So if you have been waiting, then now is your chance to jump in. And you'll see that nice new shiny option there in the create load balancer screen. Uh, or command line, I imagine. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I think further down in the article, it's like, if you want to do this command line, here's how, I think it actually gives oh, you yeah, the CLI actually give options. You the, yep. Yeah, it's like, do this. So uh, don't forget to update, though, because I suspect that option may not be supported depending on what tool you're using. Um, so it's up to date, see how it works, uh, and hopefully nothing goes wrong. There you go. Yeah. Hey, hopefully nothing goes wrong because UDP doesn't retransmit. Yep. All right, so uh, <laughs> moving on to our next one over at Forbes. Warning issued for millions of Microsoft Windows 10 users. So, Justin, I know you're in a panic over this. Uh, oh, I'm tore up. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't even know how I have time to continue doing this podcast. i got to go fix all my machines. Uh, many, I, we're, we're being facetious. How many Windows machines do you have? Absolutely none. <laughs> Absolutely none. So the one window machine that I had, I immediately formatted it and put on... Uh, uh, Linux. Um, so there you go. Now one could argue that maybe that's not the greatest decision as well. I, I have had some trouble with that, but I haven't had PC Doctor Toolbox yeah. uh, that has horrible security vulnerabilities. So there's that. So this one, uh, you know, I, I do have several Windows machines, but none that were actually affected by this one, fortunately. Uh, basically, this is another vulnerability in pre-installed software, or what most of us call bloatware. Uh, you know, we had the the Asus update. Uh, thing earlier this year that's kind of very similar to that. Uh, what makes this one a little worse is it's packaged with some big vendors like Dell. Uh, Dell actually packages the software. And Justin, you mentioned it by name, right? PC Doctor Toolbox. But several vendors take it and rebrand it because if you pay them enough, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, and so it has a number of different names. The article actually lists several of the names buried in here somewhere. Support Assistant, I think, is the Dell one. Dell builds Toolbox into Support Assistant. Re Corsair relabels it as One Diagnostics or just Diagnostics. Staples is Easy Tech Diagnostics to buy. I don't know if I've ever seen that. Yeah, I don't it's know. It's iSeries Dynavox Diagnostic Tools. And, the, and then I love the little... And there will inevitably be more partners uh, so that rebrand it. Yeah. yeah, so good times. So that makes this one a hard one to identify because you don't necessarily know if you're running PC Doctor Toolbox or not. Uh, but there is a vulnerability in the software. Uh, Dell has already released a patch for it. But I, I know me specifically. I, I don't update bloatware. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, I, I format the machine when I get it, but not everybody does that. And this is one of the the firm that, that found this initial. There was actually a previous flaw. They'll patch that one, and then they found additional flaws. And it said there's a high likelihood there's going to be additional vulnerabilities found just because of you know what what they're finding, the types of vulnerabilities they're finding. Uh, the article actually recommends immediately format and reinstall Windows without bloatware. Uh, sometimes that's a little more difficult, especially if you're not you know, maybe you don't feel comfortable doing that. It actually says, find a friend, a family member, somebody who can do it and do it. Uh, so I thought that was a funny little tip. I actually recommend that as well. Um, I, I do that for my parents whenever sure. they get a new computer, but. I don't, I don't think that's realistic. I don't, yeah. I don't think most 
uh, at least most Americans are not in a position where they can reinstall Windows on their machine. Uh, and anyway, it's, it's, it's a lot of effort, especially yep. if you have drivers to deal with. So at least uninstalling the diagnostic software that comes with it. Uh, it's the diagnostic nature of the software that really causes the problem here, because in order to run hardware diagnostics, this software has to run at the administrative level. So it has hooks into some of the drivers that Dell and, and other vendors package, which means it can perform administrative tasks without generating a UAC prompt. And, and that's a, a big, big issue because people don't even know what's happening. Well, that, that's bad. Yeah. That's, that's, that's no <laughs> that's good not, at all. Not so uh, good. And, and it was, uh, they said that they were able to uh, inject a malicious payload in one of the dynamic link libraries that this was using after the scan started. So then that becomes all kinds of bad. Yeah, and that was really the root of this particular flaw. I don't think I mentioned it, was that it doesn't, they didn't digitally sign their DLLs. So you can swap out or replace the DLLs, either the physical file, or you can even swap them out in RAM, and the software won't know it. And then it'll just run whatever it is you stuck in there, which in turn is going to be running with full administrative privileges. That's a, a big problem. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily blame Dell or, or you know the hardware vendors there. Uh, although... If they know the prepackaging of all these systems, they should be doing some audits of their own, and, and we'll have to see where that goes. But you know who wouldn't have messed this up? The U.S. government. And we got a, uh, a warning that on bleeping computer. U.S. government warns of data wipers used in Iranian cyber attacks. And, uh, and this one was kind of interesting. Uh, every week we have some kind of news article where such and such nation state is attacking the U.S. or, or some other country. Uh, and it's usually just kind of lightly detailed or whatever. This one issues all that and just says, forget it. Let's not actually reference an actual attack, but let's talk about what's happening. Um, some of the new attacks, the new uh, malware payloads that are coming out of Iran uh, aren't encrypting your machine and trying to get some Bitcoin. They aren't eavesdropping and snooping. They're just wiping your computer, which really brings us full circle all the way back to the Michelangelo virus back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, where it would just format your computer on what was supposedly Michelangelo's birthday. I think the the Iranian cyber attacks have kind of brought us back to the golden age of computing. And this is one of those things, like the ransomware, I understand the the wiping. Is this just to hopefully make it, like to, to cripple you in some way as far as like getting rid of your data? Like I don't or is it just being malicious to watch the world burn kind of thing? So it, it depends on how this is being targeted, and they don't really mention that in the article. Um, if you think about the cyber attacks that uh, uh, some unknown state-sponsored uh, organizations that were, were definitely not the U.S. and Israel uh, sent malware against Iranian nuclear plants uh, a while back. It was all specifically targeted to their SCADA uh, to, the, to all of their, their industrial controls that power the, the plant. And the malware brought the nuclear plant to a, a stop, right? It was very, very targeted. Well, if you were to wipe the control system for an industrial system like that, it, it would bring it to a standstill. So this could be something that is designed to function that way, to cripple infrastructure like your electric grid or so on. Uh, it could be designed like, uh, what was it, not Petya or no, it was regular Petya that spread across the Ukraine when um, when Russia didn't invade and annex part of the Ukraine. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow, this, this is taking a weird <laughs> turn on the podcast. Uh, and then more news. Allegedly, that's the word. I need to be saying allegedly more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that makes it all right. As long as you put allegedly in front, or with no disrespect. Those are two terms that you're always good with. <laughs> There's all these like just blatantly obvious things going on in our world right now that if you if you watch the media, people just don't want to take a stand on. <laughs> and so so anyhow, when 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 Russia moved in on the Ukraine, they, they pushed out Petya to basically cripple machines and and they weren't discriminatory there. I mean, it was really hitting as many machines as they could because they know like if you want to do a a riot or a protest or put together a militia, what are you going to do? You're going to go to Facebook. You're going to go to Twitter. You're going to try and communicate with people however you can. And shutting down computers, shutting down internet service, that's all a part of that. So um, this could be a prelude to that, or it could just be malicious. It doesn't necessarily matter. The The thing here is that if your system gets infected, it's the, the goal is to wipe the machine and, and do some damage. So we're starting to see some of that popping up. We'll, we'll see if it picks up. Uh, I know because the, the flip side of this is all true, too. U.S. cyber attacks against Iran have been picking up significantly since that drone was shot down last oh, week. Yeah. And that means that we might be witnessing our first in-the-open cyber war where kind of uh, shots have already been fired on both sides. I'm curious to see how far this one goes. Uh, yeah, I, I guess the impact there, and it's not something we really bring to the forefront of our mind, but the impact can be a little more widespread than 
then maybe in, right if you in, get into a major telecom or like a major grid mm-hmm. infrastructure for even like a major metropolitan area, it wipes the machines. Things go horribly awry real fast. Yeah, and uh, and all the rules around this stuff are pretty much non-existent. That you know, like for for the United States, and I know we have some listeners that are outside of the U.S., so the rules are different in different places. But uh, in theory, at least, if our president decided to militarize and send divisions of soldiers over to another country to attack, uh, he's got to get permission from Congress first, right? Uh, or it can be thinly disguised as a uh, uh, police action or something like that. But as soon as it exceeds a certain amount of troops, you've got to get Congress involved. But if they decide to militarize the cyber warfare divisions and say, wipe out the internet and, and power grids or whatever for this country, there's no rules that say they have to ask Congress for that. And there's, there's like absolute discretion uh, to, to do whatever they want. So these are a whole brave new area of cyber warfare, and we'll see where it goes. Uh, well, for some reason, Don, I feel like buying a storage container and burying it in my backyard now, just based on that little well, interlude. Well, make, make sure it has like an IoT thermostat. Yeah, uh, <laughs> obviously. I need to be comfortable in my, in my underground bunker <laughs> that is possibly filled with water here and radon. But yeah, so yeah, that's uh, that's a good part. We're here in Florida, you can't bother with a bunker because mm. the bunker will kill you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to wear hip waders anywhere you go in it. And you're like, you smell that? I don't, but it's slowly hurting me. Yep. Yeah, so just, uh, no good. You're extending and shortening your life all at the same time. <laughs> uh, you know, let's move on to something fun because it's depressing. So uh, a really cool thing came out that caught me by surprise. Uh, and, and just I know you are a big Raspberry Pi uh, aficionado yourself. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 is now on sale starting once again from $35. Really amazing to see that product not go up in price. Uh, I, I knew that the Raspberry Pi 4 was being planned and it was supposed to come out in 2020. Uh, so caught me by surprise here that it's like uh, over six months in advance. Not only are they done, it, you can go and, and order yours right now. I've never seen anybody come in ahead of schedule like that. Yeah, it, actually, I was pretty impressed by that as well. It said that... Um Due to some, uh, I think they were, were like working on the, the silicon. They're like, yeah, it came in like six to 12 months ahead of schedule. So they just went ahead and pushed it forward. And I was like, that's crazy. Now, some of these new features, I was pretty happy to see. Uh, USB 3 uh, is on there. Supports dual monitors. If you can find, uh, what is it, micro or mini HDMI cables to your full HDMI. Uh, and you can get up to four gigabytes of RAM. That one's not $35, though. That one's $55. But as far as I was thinking about this, if if I just needed something to surf the Internet or, you know, play around on the television, stream movies, this would be a great, um, you know, kind of platform for that. Now, I know we've talked about in the past, from a security standpoint, has this changed anything? Like, or should I still be worried about Raspberry you Pis? Know, so the, the Raspberry Pi, the hardware, is not the problem. You know, it, it's good hardware. Absolutely use it for your projects. The problem is Raspbian. Uh, so Raspbian is kind of that default OS that, that uh, well, I mean, they don't prepackage an OS at all with it, but you can go to the Raspberry Pi site, uh, raspberrypi.org, and you download Raspbian, you throw it on there, and you go. And that operating system is designed as a, uh, uh, is one that's supposed to be just super easy for you to jump right in and start configuring your interaction with the I.O. pins and all that mess. It's not a security first thing, right? When you install it, the default username is Pi and the password is Raspberry or the other way around. Yeah, I, I forget I which one it is. I always have to look that up, but yeah, it has default passwords yep, and, and username and root access, yep. you know, and, uh, and, and it doesn't, I, I don't think the like the IP tables, the firewall is not turned on by default. Like the, from a security standpoint, it is not a secure device. So you have to make a choice, which is you can take Raspbian and try and secure it, right? Actually put things in place to, to lock it down, or you can throw another OS on there. Uh, like, uh, there's unofficial Ubuntu builds you can throw on there, Fedora, you know, other Linux distros. You can even throw Windows 10 on there, right? They've got that Windows 10... Um, I think it's Windows 10 IoT. Yeah. Some, yeah, I think it is IoT. Uh, and yeah, it'll it'll go on the Raspberry Pi. So, you know, from that standpoint, you know, that that's really where the security complaint comes in, is, is Raspberry and not the hardware. But from a hardware side... It's got Bluetooth 5.0. Uh, it's yeah, got great graphics. It does up to 4K resolution on those monitors. This is this thing's a little beast. And it's got built-in AC wireless now. Uh, I don't know if that was in the previous one. I'm, I have a, a version three. I usually just connect them, you know, 
through Ethernet, but that's handy because I had an original Raspberry Pi one. You had to, you had to buy all these dongles. You got stuff hanging off of it. So that's pretty interesting. They did say they're still going to manufacture the previous ones because they do have an industrial customers that are still using those. Don, I know you and I have a love hate relationship with USB C. That is now the power cord here. Uh, they moved that to uh, use USB C for power instead of, I think it was micro USB before? Yes. Yep. And, you know, honestly, in this case, I can actually see it being useful because one problem I've had with Raspberry Pis over the years uh, have you had under voltage on yours? I have. I actually bricked my first one doing that, I'm pretty sure, because I had like a kernel panic and then things just stopped happening. Yeah, it's a, you know, they, they give you that micro USB port and people would just take whatever their cell phone charger was and stick it on there and it might be 0.5 amps. And they would tell you like, oh, you really need like a one amp charger and most of them aren't. On the USB side, I mean, you can get some that are what, four or five amps, probably even higher if you well, really needed it. But, well, uh, I think, uh, I th what is it? It's 20 watts um, for our chargers, our Mac chargers. I mean, I, I want to say those are like Maybe four amps can get up to four amps. Maybe. Yeah, cause you have to do the math. What is it yeah, like? Amp time volt equals time watts. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know I'd have to. Like, yeah. But I, I know, like, I've got the sixty-five watt charger for my laptop, and so it's yeah. you know through the roof. But uh, so on the USB side, there, I, I think that'll probably make it a little bit easier to get a power adapter that is providing adequate power to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, so that'll be nice. Uh, the only real limitation I see is that it's got that one point five gigahertz quad core ARM Cortex. Uh, which is a three times speed or roughly three times speed improvement over the old CPU, uh, but I I still found it sluggish at certain points and you know some of that storage, but a lot of it is CPU. Uh, storage can make a, a big difference. I've tried non class ten ST ah oh, atrocious performance, uh, but I do have a couple of Raspberry Pi twos, and if you do a side by side comparison from the two to the three, night and day difference for me. Uh, now from the three to the four. Uh, maybe not so much. I mean, it does say three times performance, but it's still four cores. It's still it still already have a little more oomph. Maybe with the four yeah. gigabyte, you might see a little more performance, or maybe you can open three Chrome tabs instead of two. I'll, I'll have to order some for us so we can mess around <laughs> yeah. with them. Uh, the one gig model is the base model at $35, the two gig at $45, and the four gig at $55 for 20 bucks. That's worth it, in my opinion. Um, you will need new cases, though. Uh, the port configuration has changed. I know that was nice between the earlier models where they stayed the same. Yeah, the port configuration did change. However, the GPIO pins, all those headers and uh, pigtails and stuff will still work uh, per this little release. I, maybe I should get one of these for my parents. Right, they they they're looking to update. They got an older computer, and they just surf the internet. Maybe this, maybe I'll give it a try with the the four model with four gigabytes of RAM if they're yeah. just surfing the internet. Although it, it, you can you can go to Best Buy and get like a three hundred dollar laptop. Mm -hmm. uh, the Raspi at fifty five dollars is a steal, right? But then you still have to get the power adapter and a case and a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse. And 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 by the time you're done, you're probably in the two hundred dollar range at least, right? That monitor. But they already have USB keyboard, USB mouse, and a monitor that supports HDMI. All right. Yeah, so we've already got so, that stuff. Because then it's just a t -t -t uh but I don't know. My dad like calls me in a panic when Firefox crashes. So I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe maybe we'll stay away from this because he would be fascinated by how small it is. And he's like, Do I plug stuff in here? So I don't mm. know. But I am pretty excited. Um might have to get one for my house, you know, to put with my other ones. So it's almost like I have a collection that I don't really use for anything right now. Well, you'll, you're going to build that Beowulf cluster one of these days, right? Yeah, eventually, eventually. Yeah, I got my whole little stack system, my my short Ethernet cables. That I just haven't, I haven't dug in you real hard. You yeah. got to have a vision. You got to have some grand goal to achieve. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of grand goals, uh, this week it seemed like Canonical had a grand goal of driving everyone away from Ubuntu. Uh, so uh, on Canonical's blog, uh, they issued they issued a statement, which I, I grabbed the follow-up, didn't I? Darn it. Um, yeah, yeah, this is the follow-up. Well, anyhow, they made an announcement last week, and they said that in a future version of Ubuntu, they were going to drop the support for the 32-bit libraries in the operating system. Now, uh, they have switched to a 64-bit only model as far as the distro itself, but it was still packaged with 32-bit libraries so you could run 32-bit applications. What they were proposing was dropping those libraries so that future versions of Ubuntu would only run 64-bit applications, and that's it. Now, that seemed like a good idea at the time. They've now backtracked and reversed and said, whoop, never mind. In 19.10 in and 20.4, uh, 20.04, 
we will maintain 32-bit libraries. So if you were up in arms and in a panic over that, don't worry. You'll still be able to run your 32-bit applications in the newer version of Ubuntu. I found it interesting that uh, I think they said somewhere in this article or the, the follow-up, we consulted Valve, I guess, uh, for Steam, right? Yeah. So the, you know, the, the first I heard about this was from the Wine Project mm. uh, and uh, Crossover that – uh, Crossover is kind of like the commercial arm that pushes, or Code Weavers is the company that makes Crossover, and Crossover is the commercial code that then leads to Wine or whatever. Anyhow, it's all tied together, and it, it's the the Windows emulation inside of uh, Linux, which they'll tell you Wine is not an emulator, but it is an emulator. So either way, uh, but basically, it depends on a ton of those 32-bit libraries. And people use Wine to run 32-bit applications. So if you remove the libraries under the hood, all of a sudden Wine is broken. And the only real solution would be to convert it over to like a flat pack where you package all the libraries, which means now the Wine project would have to maintain all those 32-bit libraries, which would be a nightmare for them. Their argument is, well, Canonical is already maintaining these libraries, so they should just keep doing it instead of making us do it. I don't think that's a good argument. Canonical didn't either, so they ignored it. Uh, but then Valve came out and said, oh, remember how we recommend Ubuntu as our default, pl default platform for Steam on Linux? We're not going to do that anymore. In fact, we're dropping support for Ubuntu altogether, and we're going to pick another distro. Uh, and the day after Valve said that, Canonical said, whoops, never mind. No, no, we need to maintain that, otherwise people won't install our software. We were talking crazy back there. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's... That's on us. Uh, we didn't mean we were going to do it. We were, we were just we, taking a poll. Yeah, we were just thinking about it. We were just like, you know, what if we got rid of all these 32-bit packages? It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Uh, yeah, actually, in this, this follow-up, it was the wine community, Ubuntu Studio, and some also, uh, what is Ubuntu? Ubuntu Studio is like media? Like well, it's their prepackaged media. I think it has like GIMP and maybe Blender and stuff like that written up. I wonder if those use some of those. Maybe, or uh, if they had Codex. Yeah, I maybe. wonder, you know, some of the video decoding and stuff like that, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure on that one. But I don't know why we're still posturing about it. They decided to revert it. And uh, so, yeah, 1910, 20.04 LTS, we'll still have 32-bit packages, select 32-bit packages that and, are important. You know, this isn't the first time something like this happened. I, I remember when Windows dropped the 16-bit subsystem, and I've... I've run into that a few times where I still had a 16-bit application and I couldn't run it under Windows. Something really old. So sometimes it's just nostalgia or fun. Like, oh, what was that game that I played when I was a kid? But other times it's, oh, remember that classroom management software we used to use to track all the training we delivered back in 2000? And it turns out it was a 16-bit application and I can't launch it to get into it. So the, the solution is easy. You run a virtual machine. You fire up a VM, and then you do whatever you want in there. And that's how Canonical looked at it, is, look, there's technologies. You can run it in a VM. Uh, but that doesn't work so well for video games or when you're emulating, like with Wine. And I could see with the studio people, like, if you're doing video encoding, doing it on bare metal is nice and fast. Doing it in a virtual machine usually isn't. So when performance is a concern, virtual machines are not normally your go-to. All right, let's, uh, let's continue on with a little bit more of Windows. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had an article on the Windows terminal that was being released. And in fact, IT Pro TV's Adam Gordon released a YouTube video that was quite popular on how you could build it. Uh, it. It was a massive undertaking. Justin, you helped with that, right? Yeah, yeah. Me and Adam spent about four hours doing that. Uh, now, once we figured out all the like crazy hoops and the dances that we needed to, to, to do, it, it actually was pretty fast. But at the time... It was got to have this compile, got to have this version, set yep. these flags, download this. Now, you know, touch your nose and stick your tongue out and cross your fingers. And but now it's work. in the Windows Store, right? It's in the Windows Store, yep. So from the Windows Command Line Tools for Developers blog, uh, they have announced that the Windows Terminal is now in preview in the Microsoft Store. And sure enough, I didn't watch the video, and I didn't put four hours of time in, but before the episode today, I jumped into the Windows Store and installed it, and I am now the uh, the proud owner of the Windows Terminal in Preview, and so I can launch it and have tabs and all that other good stuff. I can fire up my little Ubuntu machine here in the background, and I can do all of that uh, without even having to install Visual Studio, which is nice because I don't have it. <laughs> uh, I was being nice. I, I, was, I was trying to help out, Adam, because, uh, you know, as we established earlier, I have zero Windows machines, so I had no dog in this fight. But, you know, overcoming I think a challenge. I, I, somebody went, look, a problem. Get it. And I was like, oh, it is a problem. I'm going to get it. So uh, I will say it is pretty slick. And the 
you know, we did the, the, the beta, like super beta testing, and it is pretty slick once you got everything set up. Uh, and this will work with the Windows subsystem for Linux 2 at, at some point, right? Is that still in beta? Uh, that is, uh, WSL2 is available if you're in the fast ring of the Windows Insider preview builds. So, like, I can't I can't put it on my laptop, but I have it on my computer at home. Gotcha. And so, you know, the the little bit that I played around with it, it was pretty slick and having tabs and, you know, definitely check it out. It was it was fun. If I had a Windows machine, it would be on mine. Yeah. I, I use a different program. Uh, actually, I use Royal TS and MOBA Xterm are, are two different programs I use that give me that tabbed shell stuff. Uh, but it's nice to see something built into the OS, one less thing to install. Uh, you know, let's stick on the Microsoft side. They uh, put out an announcement. They've been kind of doing internal security audits over at Microsoft, uh, and they have a internal policy now where they have officially banned the use of Slack inside of Microsoft, uh, and they've also discouraged employees from using AWS and Google Docs internally. Uh, you know, and obviously, obviously they have Microsoft solutions for all of these, right? Microsoft Teams instead of Slack. Uh, Azure instead of AWS, and Office 365 instead of Docs. So it, it makes sense to encourage employees to use their, their you know, eat, eat their own dog food, right? Use their own products. Uh, but Slack was the only one they officially banned. And that got a bit of press from The Verge and several other, other sites that were kind of reporting on it. Uh, and this is one of those things where I initially thought it was because of, t- no, we have our own product. Don't do this. Uh, but I think their official statement was, they could not enforce appropriate controls without the the top tier license for like intellectual property management and things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I can see that you don't want someone slacking over some hidden you know message or things that should be internal. And I think that was a similar justification for Google Docs as well that they couldn't enforce intellectual property. Uh, rights. Yeah, and I, I, I can speak to this personally because I've had to deal with this where uh, with Office 365, you can run audits and see all user activity and see who sent what data where and, and what IP address is connected. Like you get full visibility into what's happened with your data. With Slack, you get visibility into the public channels, but if even as a Slack administrator, if you're the account admin, you are not allowed to see DMs. And so employees can be redistributing intellectual property, sharing information outside of the boundaries that you set through Slack, doing file shares and so on through DMs, through direct messages, and the administrators have no access to that. And Slack's stance has always been that, uh, you know, we're supposed to be encouraging communications and employees should be allowed to have private communications in confidence and not feel like their their management is watching them. Uh, The only real solution is with Slack, if you go to their highest level of subscription, which is their, I believe it's called the enterprise grid, Mm -hmm. uh, that at that point, you, the company, set the encryption keys, which is nice because you you, you know you can trust your own keys, but you've got the keys. So you can actually decrypt the DMs and and see what's in there. So now you get full visibility inside of it. So uh, companies are starting to realize that if they're going to stand up in front of a judge and say, I've looked everywhere, I know this wasn't leaked, and then they're running Slack in the background, then we know, well, they didn't actually look everywhere. That there's certain certain places they couldn't get to. So um, that's going to be an interesting one. I I bet we'll see Slack kind of you know change that policy a little bit. They've got to give discovery for that. And right now they just say, look, if the courts need it, have them send a subpoena to Slack. And as long as Slack is generating the security keys, they can they can get at it. Well, it used to be uh, the, the Slack versions. I remember when there was a. a a changeover where you could pay for that top level tier and then you could get visibility into some of those DMs using mechanisms that you described. But originally, if I'm not mistaken, I think all Slack, like if that was period, no one could look at DMs and that was a management issue. Then they issued a statement to say, Hey, we're going to offer some different pricing tiers. DMs aren't necessarily always going to be <laughs> private. Uh, They're just sometimes FYI. private. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just sometimes private. But yeah, it was a, a crazy requisition process. If you wanted to look into DMs, you had to send to Slack. Um, so, you know, from an em- employee standpoint, yeah, you're like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be spied upon. I don't want to be spied upon period, whether I'm an employer at my house, but at the same time, if it's company, inf- you know, intellectual property or private information, I, I fully see, Hey, I need to make sure you're not redistributing or leaking information that is harmful to the company or any other manner like that. So I can see both sides of the fence on that one. Now, our next article is almost the exact opposite of what we just said. Uh, this is from VentureBeat. Microsoft announces OneDrive Personal Vault for sensitive files. So now, inside of your OneDrive, you can actually create a personal vault where it is encrypted storage in OneDrive. that You can put your data, 
where you've set the key so no one else can access it, even people that you've shared your OneDrive to. Uh, and so now you've got this ultra super secret repository for information, uh, which begs the question, well, wait a minute, Microsoft just said they needed audit capabilities across all this stuff, and now they're offering this feature. Uh, so I haven't actually seen this one in production yet because this is a, it's been announced, it's not available yet. Um, I'm assuming that the encryption key is like a recovery key or something is stored in the enterprise. So you have e-discovery across this, which makes it not really personal anymore. Um, but either way, uh, what they're doing is providing encryption as a part of OneDrive so that if you sync your OneDrive down to a desktop where the hard drive is not encrypted, well, that vault will actually be encrypted on that drive. And this is very similar to services that, like I, I already use one called Cryptomator. Uh, do you know Cryptomator? I, have, I do not. Do you know Cyberduck? I do know Cyberduck. Cyberduck, wildly popular uh, uh, SFTP client that is available on Mac OS. And, and is it Windows also? I know it, it's on Mac OS. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think at one point it was Mac only. Maybe it does have. Well, we can and look it, it, up. it provides connectivity to S3 buckets and other things too. So it's like a really flexible file client. Well, they released a free program called Cryptomator, and it is awesome. I've been using it for, for a while now. Uh, and I, I have certain things like website SSL certificates. Right, I have the private keys for these certificates. I got to store them somewhere. I don't want to just throw them in Dropbox <laughs> and say, "Oh, it'll be safe." They're, they're private keys. So you take Cryptomator and you create a vault and you throw them in there, and then you synchronize the vault. And so this copy of my encrypted vault is replicated between machines, and then I have to unlock the vault to get into those certificates. I just leave it locked all the time uh, until I actually need to get one of those private keys. It's a great system, and from the description of OneDrive Personal Vault, it sounds exactly the same. So if you're looking for something a little more vendor neutral, check out Cryptomator. It's it's free. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to get that because i got a couple of... I, I've been looking for a solution. I'm like, I need to store these keys. I mm -hmm. actually have a couple of private keys. I don't want them to disappear on my hard drive. I need yeah. to back them up, but... If I could encrypt them, and by the way, it is also Windows now, uh, not just Mac only. Cyberduck so, is? Yeah, Cyberduck yeah, I, I know Cryptomator is. And actually, Cryptomator, they have uh, a mobile apps now, too. Mm -hmm. uh, so that that's pretty – I think they cost money, though. I think it's like $9 in the iOS app store. Uh, but on the other side, like anything sensitive, Cryptomator does really cool stuff. So they, they encrypt it, and it's not just one file. Because then if the file size changes, an attacker kind of has an idea of how much data you've stuck in there or whatever. Uh, so they actually break it up, and it's all like – name differently and size differently so you have no idea how many files are in there or how much data like they've really thought it through oh that's slick because i i just i was like oh it's just a it's like a zip archive but no I, there's a little gif on their um on their website what that shows on? like breaking the files up and like giving them crazy names like base url Here, like uh, base 64 find it yeah I, uh, uh if you this one? Yeah, this one. Uh, so if we, we look at my laptop for a second, uh, we've got to hear where the file is getting encrypted. So they're showing like that that vault uh, file right there and how the folder name is obfuscated. And then you got all these files inside of it. And it's all different pieces that unless you provide the private key, it doesn't know how to stick them together. And you can you can put this in Dropbox, OneDrive, whatever, uh, and it, it just synchronizes all this mess across. But when you point Cryptomator at it, it, it knows it's a vault and it opens it up, mounts it like a drive. Beautiful. I'm gonna to have to. So. I'm gonna have to invest some time in this. Yep. I I use it personally. Mm. Uh, this, it's got, it's got the Bazette stamp of approval. I, it this feels like this is an ad. I know. I feel like I should have a promo code. <laughs> Sign up with promo code Cryptomator Don. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but not. But it's free. So yeah. yeah. So. All right. Let's jump over to ZDNet for the uh, uh, probably one of the more shocking stories uh, or conspiratorial ones. Uh, ZDNet reports these hackers broke into 10 telecom companies to steal customers' phone records. Uh, so 10 telcos in Europe, uh, mostly in Europe. There weren't any in the U.S. Uh, they say that hackers have managed to compromise their network. They've been in there for years, since 2017 uh, at least, maybe longer. Uh, and they've had full access to all of the call logs and text message metadata. They, they haven't said text message bodies yet. Uh, so they basically had uh, access to a lot of information, including geolocation data for 10 different telcos covering pretty much the European continent. So that's a pretty big collection of information. They said, I believe at some point, they said it was terabytes of data they've collected uh, on all of this activity. So something that blew my mind, they were like, oh, they're like the de facto shadow IT department. In fact, they had their own VPN set up 
inside of these and had 10 different administrator accounts. Ah, that's that's bad. That's that's real bad. But you know, I think it said Europe, Africa, Middle East, Asia. Um, but oh, it's, I thought it was just Europe. Yeah. It's so it that. says effective targets. Yep. And they said, but they haven't really been poking around on everybody. They've been like targeting high, what they call high value targets. So I'm, I guess they were just waiting, going, oh, well, look at that. So yeah, I, I saw that they had picked something like twenty people, and and this is all coming from security firm Cyber Reason, who we we've interviewed in the past. They're they're a good group, uh, and. They're not giving out a lot of details, which means they're probably working with governments right now to try and deal with this. Uh, but basically, they were targeting 20 high-value targets. And with this data, they knew where they were at any given time because the geolocation data was there. And they knew who they were calling and when they were calling them. Uh, they knew who they were texting. So they really had a lot of visibility. Like If you wanted – let's go super conspiratorial – if you wanted to assassinate somebody, knowing their location, knowing their routine, they could figure it all out right here. And – they're not hacking that person's phone. They're not pushing malware down to their laptop. That person would have no way to know this was happening. They, like literally no way to know. The telco were the only ones who could detect it. And uh, cyber reason, they don't mention how they got involved, if they had found it on their own or if they were hired by one of those telcos and then found the, the extent of the breach. Uh, but either way, you know, they've, they've detected it now and they're working to, uh, to cut that off. That pesky metadata has some far-reaching uh, ramifications. That's kind of like the XF data on phone pictures or text messages. Sure. Because uh, you're like, oh, well, what could they do? Well, they know when you took the picture or sent the text message. They know they, a lot of times they know where it was, how often you've done it, who it's to. And then they just start building patterns. And they go, oh, well, Justin always takes this route home. And he gets a phone call at 501 every day, Monday through Friday. So he's usually at this intersection. Yeah, we'll just show up. So that stuff scares me. And, and but I went super conspiratorial as well. Um, that's just bad though. There's, they've been rooting around since 2017. You know, when you said Justin gets a phone call every day at 5:01 p.m., the first thing that popped in my head was not that that's unusual. It was parole officer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we we gave him a chance here. Uh, you know, we knew about his background. He had, you know. His, uh, just so I want to make it clear, <laughs> I do not have any felonies. Uh, but yeah, I got to check in every day. Uh, and you know, if they had this metadata, they would know that. They would. Oh, Makes yeah. you wonder why they have to do the ankle bracelets. Uh, <laughs> so, all right. Well, that's not the only thing the hackers have been up to. Uh, our last real article of the day is uh, from one that is right in our backyard uh, from Gainesville.com, which is our, our local newspaper here. Hacker paid for, makes it sound like a hacker paid. They didn't. Um, I'm going to change the headline. Lake City, which is a city nearby. Oh, this would be a weird headline, right? The city of Lake City uh, has decided to pay $490,000 in Bitcoin to recover from a ransomware attack. So earlier this month, uh, several weeks ago, actually, uh, the city got hit by ransomware. All their machines got locked down. Uh, they were not able to recover from backups. And they did have cyber insurance. They reached out to the insurance company, and the insurance company said, all right, pay your deductible, and then we'll pay the ransom. And so the insurance company is paying the $490,000 in Bitcoin to get their machines unlocked and get back to their data. Uh, that's the second Florida city in recent weeks, and we can add that on to Baltimore. Well, Baltimore didn't pay. Uh, they did, they are... just said, whatever. We'll just leave it be. Yeah. Let it ride. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it'll decrypt itself. Uh, yeah. Eventually. <laughs> If, if we just start hammering keys at it, well, I bet we could guess the keys if we tried yeah, hard enough and long enough. Yeah, sooner or later. <laughs> Eons later when Baltimore is but a distant thought in past. Uh, yeah, this is, this is an, at least they did have cyber insurance, right? Um, I guess, yeah. <laughs> Depending but, on how you want to look at that. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't see anywhere. Why, why couldn't they recover from backups? Or was it because they lacked backups at all? Or did you see anything about that? Because it's a small Florida town oh. with a population of, what's the population of Lake City? Like 90,000 or something? Oh, I was um, going to go seven. It's, it's in the article somewhere. They mentioned the population. It's not a gigantic city. Um, let's see. Uh, the one from the other week, Riviera Beach, they say it's 35,000 people. Lake City's got to be closer to 100,000 people, right? Somewhere around there. Either way, you know, a lot of these cities, they, they have a budget put in place, and they do things, and they're not necessarily thinking about the, the various attacks that come in, and they're not being prepared. Tons and tons of companies are not prepared to handle ransomware attacks. They're doing online backups to systems that are connected. You know, pe people think about Time Machine and how great it is, right? Well, 
your time machine drive is attached to your Mac so it can run its backup. So if your Mac gets hit with ransomware, your time machine backup gets hit with ransomware. So you've got to redesign your backups. And, and many organizations have not done that. Uh, and that that is what I suspect has happened. Of course, they're not going to talk about it because now it's wrapped up in the, the insurance system. But we'll find out over time exactly what happens. And this is all assuming the hackers even bother to send the decryption keys because I think they said in like over 40% of occurrences, they don't send the keys. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big risk. Yeah, that's a, you're betting on someone who just took you hostage of having like some kind of moral or like, yeah, I'll give you the keys back. You gave me my money. I don't know. That's, that's an unfortunate thing. I, I hope they get their, all their data back or that they actually get the keys. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing to think about, let, let's say they were backing up to like LTO tape right, or DT, DLT, whatever it is, um, with those tapes, you they're in the machine, you take them out of the machine, so ransomware doesn't affect those, right? They could then spend days or even weeks reformatting all their machines, reinstalling the operating systems, restoring the data from those tapes, because it's a slow process. So you're still taking a huge hit, and even if you do the restore perfectly, your machines are obviously vulnerable somehow, so they're just going to get hit again. So it's still a lot of legwork. If you can prevent, that's even better. So more and more people are moving away from centralized antivirus, and that's that's not necessarily a great decision for most people, that you need to have some kind of system in place that's protecting your machines, email filtering, all that kind of stuff in place to make sure that you stop these attacks from happening in the first place. All right, let's move on to our fun article of the week. We had a crazy one. All the hacking that we just talked about in this podcast could have been avoided, and one engineer is working to make that world a reality uh, the world's first patented unhackable computer ever is on Kickstarter right now. You can back this pr uh, program, pledge, whatever. You you can go and donate your money to this amazing cause, a hack-proof laptop. I'm really shocked that somebody hadn't invented this before, but now I realize why. This guy's got it patented. Uh, you can get the world's first hack-proof laptop. And uh, Justin, I don't know how much we, we just heard about this yesterday. So d did you have time to look over the patent? It's I didn't look over the patent, but I did read through the Kickstarter. And uh, it's, I don't know, it seems a little hand wavy to me. <laughs> um, also, it's kind of like you're going, hey, hackers, want to fight? Let's fight about it. Uh, so that, that was my first thought was like, you know, what better way to make yourself a target than to, to make a claim like this? But then I said, all right. Maybe this is real. Maybe they've come up with a way to do it. Uh, if you read the Kickstarter page, though, um, it's it's ambitious. It, it is ambitious, and uh, and the person who wrote this, uh, uh, you know, the random capitalized letters for me, you know, makes it look like a phishing attempt. <laughs> and so, but he is not lying. He actually does have a patent, and I did have a chance to read through it. I, I pulled it up from the patent office, uh, so I've got it right here, U.S. Patent 10,061,923B1, and uh, basically what he did is he filed a patent. The actual title is Safe and Secure Internet or Network Connected Computing Machine, Providing Means for Processing, Manipulating, Receiving, Transmitting, and Storing Information Free from Hackers, Hijackers, Virus, Malware, etc., that's a pretty significant claim. Fortunately, you have the whole rest of the patent to read to figure out how it works. And the proposal, it, here's what it boils down. I'll save you guys the time of reading the patent because you don't really need to bother. Uh, is What he's saying is, look, I'm going to make a laptop and, or a desktop. It doesn't really say. Um, but it's effectively going to have two computers in it, right? Two processors, two sets of memory, two sets of storage. And the operating system... And my sensitive data, that's going to go in system number one. And then my internet browser and browsing activity, that's going to go in system number two. And they don't cross in between each other at all. They're completely isolated from each other, which means hackers can't get to my personal data. And I can just flip between the two systems as I desire. Okay, so what it really describes is two computers attached to a KVM. Yeah, I was like, isn't that a KVM <laughs> switch? I feel like... Or uh, I was reading someone managed. Uh, have you ever heard of Cubes OS? Yeah, where it yeah. does a little jail box. You know, it's kind of like a what were they called? Jails. It's yeah, kind of like the jails. jails. Yep. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I might be able to get on board with that, but this, th I don't know. It's I would never say anything's unhackable. Well, so it depends on how you define hack, right? If you've got two systems on a KVM 
And one system is air gapped, right? No, no network connectivity, no anything. It's air gapped, right? It's not unhackable, but it is not remotely exploitable, right? There, there would not be a way to remotely get to it. It's an air gapped machine. Now, that also means it's going to be pretty well useless for most people because you can't check your, your Gmail or whatever on this air gapped machine. And meanwhile, you're going to jump over to the other machine that's that's actually connected to the the internet, and it can get hacked just like anything else, you know. That but uh, his his pitch is that that second machine uh, has a basically like a a read only disk. So when it is powered off, you power it back on, and it's all back to normal. So even if it did get hacked, it would just reset itself, and it would be unhacked when you boot it. And so I think that's really the claim that's being made here. But language is a big barrier on this one. And the U.S. Patent Office has shown time and time again that language is not a concern of theirs. So uh, so they've approved this one. Uh, it's a legit patent, uh, but it's not really a phenomenal idea. It's really just two computers in the same case, and you're able to switch between them. Uh, the Kickstarter is not off to a great start. Uh, how much time is left on this thing? 48, 48 days, days to go. Uh, they have raised $586 of the eight hundred and seventy thousand dollar goal, uh, my real big concern was that eight hundred seventy thousand uh, dollars was for a him, a hardware engineer, and a single software engineer. Three people. Three people, and the software engineer it says, "Oh, I'm going to be working on the operating system." A, a single person is going to be working on an op. Like, how? Did, did you look at the timeline he proposed? Three months. It's a so it's it's a one year timeline. Broken into four quarters, right? Uh, and the first three months is to write all the software. So they're gonna they're gonna write their operating system and and design their hardware in the first three months, and and then in the second quarter they're gonna build the first prototype laptop. In the third quarter they're gonna test it, and in the fourth quarter they're gonna manufacture it, and in one year they'll have it out. Now I will tell I'll just go on record as saying this. Justin, let's say you and I decided we were going to kickstart a laptop, J- just a laptop, <laughs> right? Nothing, nothing different, just a laptop, right? And you know, we're ready to use components that are available to get something like that set up with manufacturing in China and shipped over here and run through the FCC. Not the FCC. Who is it that does the um, FTC? Maybe I don't know. Whoever it is that approves electronic devices, or you don't. Have- I don't know. Anyway, Whatever, like when you start to sell electronics in the U.S., you have to get it run through somebody. Not, not I'm thinking underwriters laboratories, but that's not who. It, I mean, you can get you all listed if you want, but um, whoever you have to file with, uh, you know, every time Apple releases a new phone, it has to be approved by the F- FCC, SC, I don't know, one of those people. Uh, anyhow, to do that, I, I don't think that it's possible to do that in one year. You know, it's just it's too aggressive. And for three people to say they can do it is impossible. Uh, so then to stick all the claims of an extra functionality on top of that, this is just not not a reality. And uh, I hope I'm proven wrong. I hope a year from now we get to do a podcast and you guys can all call me idiots. We'll do hashtag Don's an idiot and, you know, I'll make it my home. And we'll all have our own un- unhackable. And we'll have our unhackable. After. I, I wish that was a true thing, but this is just so impossible that uh uh, it'll just be fun to watch it peter out. So I was talking, you know, out, out on the floor a little bit, and I think uh, Mike looked up the lines of code in Windows. It was like fifty million, I want to say, fifty million lines of code. Now it's gone through; it's got a whole bunch of stuff going on, and it's gone, you know, it's worked, but it's worked on by probably thousands of people. Ubuntu, I want to say, is like without GUIs and stuff, was what Tons. like twenty million or something like that. Yeah, like. Uh, that's uh, like ambitious, fantastical would so, be what I, how I would characterize it. So my, my favorite section was the risks and challenges section. And he says, you know, what, what risks you, um, basically Kickstarter makes you post this to say like, what are things that could derail this project? Right. Um, idiocy isn't like a check mark. Uh, but, but basically he says, I don't see any foreseeable risks involved in building this unhackable computer. So, you know, it, it's a lock, it's going to happen. Uh, but he goes on to say that only uses currently available components in the USA and other countries, which makes me think that he's just going to use a, uh, you know, off the shelf system. Right. And then he goes on to say, you know, uh, I have the source code for all the system software that is needed. So to me, that's the flag that says they're not writing their own OS. And I wouldn't be surprised to find out that this is just a laptop with two hard drives 
And then it's doing something like processor affinity to tie things to certain cores and memory allocation separated that way, in which case this is total BS. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the confusing messaging in there, this is certainly not going to be an unhackable computer. Mm. So, so I ordered five. Yeah, and uh, yeah. <laughs> anyhow. Don pledged like $800,000 just now. It was crazy. Uh, All right. I was well, like, you have uh, that kind of money? Yeah. <laughs> so we do have a interview coming up, and uh, we're going to be doing an interview with John Dixon from the Denim Group. Uh, and so I want to get to that. But before we do, let's take a quick break. And when we get back, we'll have an interview with the Denim Group. The IT Pro TV app is available for iOS and tvOS. The modern user interface makes navigation easy. Recently watched videos can be found on the home screen, as well as our daily live streams. Choose landscape mode for larger viewing. Access the entire course library by clicking on the play icon. Navigate our content by category, certification, and job role. Learn where you want and when you want as a premium annual member by downloading episodes for offline viewing. Watch on the go and pick up later on any of your favorite devices. So head to the App Store and download the IT Pro TV app. All right, welcome back, everybody, to Technado. I'm your host, Don Pazette, here in the office with Justin, and we have our guest, as promised, Mr. John Dixon from the Denim Group. We're going to be talking about uh, all the great things that they do and some other kind of fun stories that we've got because we've had a chance to interact with the Denim Group a few times over the years. Uh, but before I get too far, John, let me turn the table over to you and give you, give you a chance to introduce yourself to our viewers. All right. Hey, guys, thanks. Uh, John Dixon, I'm one of the principals at Denim Group. And Denim Group helps very large clients secure their software. So anybody that's doing web applications or publishing uh, mobile apps, we help them publish them so they don't get hacked. It's real simple. And uh, so we do a lot of code level stuff. Also have a product called ThreadFix that helps uh, our clients fix their app vulnerabilities faster. So we're in the app space, uh, been in the enterprise space for 20 plus years. and. Uh, as a consultant and as somebody out there in client areas, we see lots and lots of stuff. So, like, hopefully that'll come out in the interview today. And uh, love, you know, glad to meet you guys again, and look forward to it. So, John, just I, I have some questions about software because that's kind of my that's kind of my purview, I guess. But before we okay. do, can you tell us a little bit of like how'd you get to to the point you're at now? Uh, just so I know what topics to avoid, so you don't grill me. <laughs> <laughs> well. The way that it started, my two other business partners, Sheridan Chambers and Dan Cornell, were pure Java guys in the late 90s. And this is this is when people were building, for the first time, e-commerce sites, right? And I had met them, and I was like a you know a security guy, ex-Air Force person, and it had already been in knee-deep in security. I was a CICSP in 1998, and so I've been in the business for a long time. So we, we met. And we kind of started talking about, well, you know, the application side, the web application side, really hadn't paid too much attention to security. You started to see hacks around web apps in the early 2000s. And there were cool firms that were doing stuff in Boston and the West Coast. And we said, hey, we just want to be the coolest or the, the best little AppSec firm in Texas. And we kind of started, and the way we started, we said, hey, let's base it here. And anything within one Southwest Airlines hop will sell to those guys. So if you're in Dallas or Houston or any place we get to in one hop, we would sell to you. Otherwise, too far away. So that's kind of how our humble beginnings. And the reason people always ask, Denim Group, why, where'd you get the name? It really just kind of connotes our, uh, uh, you know, resilience. But honestly, the, the, the comfortable and casual nature of jeans and, and such. So... It has nothing to do with tech stuff. It's not a tech made up name and people remember us as a result. So that that stuck. I was really hoping that was gonna be an acronym. Like he was gonna say it stands <laughs> for D no. for, you know, those type that I was like, ah, an acrostic. Man, I, this is getting deep already. 
Justin, once a month we get an email from an offshore gene manufacturer in Manila or in Vietnam saying, hey, we want to be your preferred manufacturer. <laughs> and, and it, but, the, but the best part is they say, we've taken a very close look at your website and we would like, it's like, no, you have it. If you, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> Although you so, could the, promise them, like, we will give you 100% exclusive, you know, you will be the manufacturer of all the denim that we create. That kind of sounds like when I forgot to turn on Who Is Guard and bought a domain name. I got like a barrage of emails to be like, we are here to help you with your business. I was like, no, you're not. I'm, no, you're I don't not. have a business. No, you're not. No, you're uh, not. Now, you, I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, number one, I'm kind of reeling my, your little play on uh, the best little apps and sex apps. place in Texas. I was like, ah, it's close to something else. Um, <laughs> yeah. But also, you know, you, you had some Java guys, right? Your, your, yeah. your, your partner's there. And you're the security individual. I'm kind of interested just because it's it, working here, working with Don, you know, getting really paranoid. I tend to be more paranoid about security now from a software part than I used to be. Yeah. From your perspective, what are what is probably the most impactful thing that you're like, that could have been avoided? Oh, Lord. Wow. Where do I, how, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> So first of all, all the guys now are all security people. We've got the religion, you know, uh, that, that was 15 years ago where there was kind of, I, I joke about it. That was our Reese's cup moment where you had the chocolate and peanut butter getting stuck in it. But, uh, we, we now are proselytizing about this particular issue, but I, I, I think the biggest problem that we see in the U S and across the world now is, is just like these monumental, uh, misses where they just don't even ask the question, you know, like, so half of the flaws that you see in security are coding flaws. Well, these are, these are things that, uh, if you've heard of something called SQL injection or cross-site scripting error, those are good developers who at the keyboard make a mistake and then, you know, put a vulnerability embedded in the code accidentally, right? Those, those are fairly straightforward to find and to remediate. The ones that we that are really the bigger problems are the ones that are uh, before you even write a line of code, an architectural problem where you're like, oh, we're going to trust this over here, and in fact, you really shouldn't. And so issues like authorization and authentication, and and just particularly in a world where you're getting info from people on web services, like trust and what you trust and what you don't trust as a starting point. Uh, is an important deal. And we just see this horrific misses where it's just like, oh, we're just going to take this over here and we'll do this. It's like, well, what about that over there? And you find out, in fact, uh, that by design, before coding, they assume something that they shouldn't have. And I'll give you a great example. When we first started, we did a, we were looking at an e-commerce app and uh, we were doing a what's, you know, penetration test. And we saw uh, these same nine-digit numbers flying across. We're like, what are those nine-digit numbers? And we looked them up like the, with the magic of Google and found out they were transaction routing numbers. Well, those transaction routing numbers are those unique identifiers that you see on your check that are specific to a, a public and specific to a bank. What had happened is this financial services company was using that transaction routing number as one of the components of a login. So they were using transaction routing number and a unique ID. And they it was just like it was designed in the early 2000s. It worked. It was generating orders. And we showed them how, like, we could, building a script, we could basically figure out what their banks were and then do a random, you know, generator, create unique IDs, and then put those together and log in. We couldn't create new accounts, but we could essentially brute force and log in as somebody and then order whatever the heck we wanted to. And that's something that like when we first did did that particular uh, penetration test, the guys didn't believe it. We had to do it a second time in a live environment and show them and it was like it, seeing the faces of the of the clients, they were white, I mean they just pale face. They just were stunned that we could do that. And we had, I had to counsel our team, our delivery team and say, "Hey, when we do this, no high-fiving, no smirky faces, no kicking each other under, under the table. You have to be professional. And sure enough, we got them. We're like, here, this is how it happened. And, you know, again, the human nature reaction is to start cracking up. Like, look, look at what we did. We got you. And we had to do the poker face thing. So um, so I, I would say it's like the biggest problem we still see in most shops is like they don't consider – they don't even do deep thinking before – they start writing code, like they just start writing code, and and after the fact, they still wanted to go and check it. 
we, we do something called threat modeling, and that's a fancy term for uh, essentially a mindful uh, uh, enumeration of a, of a system on a whiteboard. And imagine like a whiteboard and you're saying, well, here's where data comes in, the ingress point, here's where it, here's where it is, here's where it's stored, here's what we trust, and here's where it goes out. And that's like stick man figure, simple, right? It's like super simple. And what happens is when you do that mindfulness, when you start to like put this stuff down and say, okay, cool, well, where are we getting authentication from? Where are we, oh, we have this third party uh, identity management system. Okay, cool, tell me about that. Basically that process, that mindful review and a design level starts to identify those crazy flaws I was telling you about, those crazy architectural problems. Very few people do that, and that's where people, they just, they, they're they looking for the magic button, they're looking for, you know, easy peasy, and it doesn't happen. So, you know, you, you've touched on something that uh, Justin and I have talked about quite a few times, is that a developer, especially one like right out of college, <clears throat> their, their focus is really on just getting something mm -hmm. to work. And, you know, they might look and see there's six different ways to approach a problem, and right. They're working on a timeline. They just grab the first one that, that gets them there, and and off they go. They're they're trying to hit that deadline. So most of them are are aware of security. They know like there's attacks that are out there, but that's not their primary focus. So if a company hasn't been paying attention to that, they they haven't been. They don't have a secure software development life cycle or anything. They're yeah. just just a, a, a coding house, and they want to correct that. They want to actually get their people a little more security conscious they would reach out to an organization like yours and, and how would you how would you help them switch because that, that's not just like a you flip a yeah. switch one day and all of a sudden you're secure right i i think the largest banks and largest financial companies are probably further down but like uh the the, the smaller companies are trying are figuring this out now uh the fortune 2500 and it's a combination of things there's not it's you can't just train people and say they're smart it's a combination of training redesigning the sdlc trying to bake in as much of the security as you can as part of the build process, uh, looking at things like software uh, libraries that you ingest beforehand, either open source or otherwise. Uh, it's a combination of things. Like I mentioned threat modeling as a design function. Uh, that's a, a pre-coding activity that's very val valuable. So what I did a series of surveys back about 2013, 2014, about training and its effect on developers and their ability to write secure code. And what I found is that about, if they go through training, it'll prove uh, a developer's ability by 25 or 30%. But like any other activity, if you don't reinforce it, it'll drop off. So guess what happens is these companies go and train everybody and they don't put any incentives in place, they don't change the SLC, they don't make it a priority, uh, and then they revert back to their uh, standard ways. The, the trends that we see now are with DevOps and CI/CD pipelines is baking in as much testing as part of the pipeline. And then on either end of the pipeline, doing training, uh, code repository or code library reviews, and then stuff on you know, live testing on the other end. But, but it still is a big, big challenge. And we see that so many companies still are not looking at everything they should. And if they're looking at it, they're looking at it infrequently. So, you know, do it as quickly as you can, uh, re-engineer the process, and if you can get it as much as this through CICD pipelines, then God bless. Now, you, you mentioned you guys started all this uh, over 15 years ago, and I, I imagine most of the problems that you saw 15 years ago are still present for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. But I think we have all new problems today, too, though, right? Because, like, like the DevOps movement, that really started, yeah. what, maybe five years ago? And so now you've got developers that have a whole new a whole new realm of responsibility that they're mostly not trained for. How, how has that impacted what you guys do? Uh, it's, it's just, it's like squeezing the balloon. I mean, like it's a different set of problems. Um, and let me give you, let me isolate one as an example. If you go back 10 years ago, uh, developers and security guys like myself didn't care where the app lived because it was pretty much on-prem in a data center behind the security controls of the perimeter. Now, you're seeing these multi-cloud or hybrid you know, approaches where we're gonna keep this in the data center, we're moving this to AWS, we're moving this to Azure. In that particular scenario, the security folks can't assume or can't be agnostic about where it lands. They actually have to provide you know, consulting or reference architectures to the devs because 
oh, you're, if you're going to put this in AWS, here's how you need to do that, and here's the template for doing that in a security correct way. If you just assume that the developers are going to do it on their own, like from on a ground, you know, ground swell of, 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 of security mindfulness, it isn't going to happen. So the cloud movement uh, and the move to cloud has now put uh, an onus on the security teams to provide more prescriptive guidance. And then secondly, kind of the energy has shifted over to how do I bake in security testing into the pipeline? How, if I've got a minute or two minutes or 10 minutes to run a scan, what do I do? What do I try to do? And then what do I do to, to continue to do the standard activities? And let me explain what I mean by that. If you're part of a nightly build or whatever commit process, the security team might be given a window to run their scans. It doesn't mean that they're going to be able to look at the, like do an entire code review of their entire code base. That, that simply is not going to happen. So what you see people doing is doing a subset, saying, okay, I'm going to run this type of scanner and look for these really egregious uh, vulnerabilities, and I'm going to ignore everything else. But that assumes that if you're doing that as part of the pipeline, that's great. And what that's catching are the 11th hour vulnerabilities that get pushed out in production that you didn't think about, that SQL injection that creates this crazy attack space that's just ephemeral. But what you have to do if that, that doesn't, that isn't your AppSec program, right? What you still have to do is at the same time, in parallel, still look at do code reviews and, other, and then join those two back at a certain point. That doesn't totally relieve you of the obligation to do the, the basic block, blocking and tackling. It just gives you some level of assurance that that 11th hour commit is not injecting a really bad vulnerability. You know, uh, the, the nice part about all this, though, and, and Justin, you can probably back me up here, is that uh, that Docker solves all these problems, right? But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yep, <laughs> absolutely. Containers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when in doubt, put it in a container. Because containers are always safe. Everybody yeah, knows that. Yeah, because I definitely don't run my containers as root uh, <laughs> or provide root-level access to all volumes mounted in the containers. It never yeah. would have happened. Um, or, or if you're from Indiana, you would run at root level access, as they say yeah, from Indiana. Writ, yeah, root level <laughs> access. Uh, so is this one of those things where automation is going to help kind of enforce these? Because yeah. you say pres prescriptive guidance. I know, you know, when I started this whole DevOps thing, usually what it meant was, hey, Justin, we're going to ask you to do something that you don't really know how to do. Uh, we, we need it done by Thursday, and it's yeah. Thursday morning, you know, that type of thing. Is this something where, you know, you're using something like Terraform or CloudFormation, you go, this is the setup. Here's your security group rules. Here's, you know, how your network's yeah. going to be structured. Here's your bastion host. These have to be in place, and we're also going to check compliance within these. Has that been as impactful? That, that's it. You just, you just nailed it. Oh. And, and But I want to go back and say, you hit on one other thing, and that is the business imperative for speed and tempo and cadence is breathtaking and, and and you know the expectations are i thought of it take you know look to the right look to your it guy and say make it so today you know like okay so create out of nothing a capability stitch it together push it in production Th i mean that's that is a little bit science fiction but it's true right versus the the waterfall development stuff from just five or ten years ago where you're like oh let's do design phase and let's do requirements and let's like that's 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 nostalgic when you think about it, but yeah. So when you hit on the other thing is is you really have figured out a way that if you can do it right, you've essentially taken variables out of those build processes. If you can get a gold standard or gold build and 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 put it and and agree to those controls that are put in that, then you're in great shape. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, you got, kind of got your start with Java, focused in on that, and, and we were talking a little bit about code review. So I, I know doing code review requires knowledge of the language in order to understand what's going on. Do you do you guys hold your reviews to certain languages? or Because, I mean, the concepts really span across any language. So do you, do you support them all, or do you hold a, a limit? All of them. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> not, not for I'm going to get all these inbound Fortran and COBOL and, uh, yeah, no, no, no. No, I mean, it's most of the modern languages, uh, most of the ones that business folks use. So so you uh, let me mention something. Most of application security is, the energy around it is still web applications, mobile too, a little bit of IoT, mostly web applications. 
the majority of applications in the enterprise are built in compiled languages, .NET and Java. What we're seeing, however, in the, in the cool kid startups, the Silicon Valley, the newer companies that are using more dynamic open source languages, cooler stuff, that's where it's a little trickier and where you need a little bit more context. And what I mean by that is just uh, you can do things differently and make mistakes. You can make mistakes in any language. So like anybody that says Java or .NET is more secure than something else. No, you can, you, can, you can hang yourself in any language. But the point is that there's some context you have to have. The tool coverage, the automated tool coverage is less in those newer languages. So here's what we do. We don't get a million line app and say, okay, let's start at the uh, top and start doing manual code reviews. Our guys would quit. So I mean, it's just very tedious, and nobody does that. Nobody does that. About we estimate a really good developer could look at maybe our appsec person could look at five or six hundred lines of code per hour to find stuff. Divide a million by five hundred thousand, and that's how many or five hundred per hour, and that's how long it would take. So what everybody does is they use some form of automation to identify hot spots. Be it you know source code reviewers or what they call static analysis. You also can look at the application in, in its runtime or in a server that's called dynamic or black box testing. So usually what guys like us do is we run automation first to get the obvious stuff, the low hanging fruit, and then from there look at issues that uh, lead us towards problems around authorization or custom logic. Usually those are the biggest and scariest ones, but they don't show up the automation just kind of points us in the right direction. We call them hot spots, and then we go from there. But we don't do any, like, just brute force. Uh, rarely do we do brute force uh, code reviews without that because it just takes too long. Now, these tools, I previous role, tried to do this with a Python app. Most yeah. of the tools were focused on Java. Uh, we go. were trying to use SonarCube to do a static analysis that actually has a, an OWASP integration, kind of looking yep. for those we never could get it to work. Is that something that you're like, yeah, yeah, we get it to work, or is it? It just tends to be easier, and sometimes. No, I mean, like uh, you hit a, you hit hit on the head again. I mean, you just uh, the challenge is these tools infer that the operator has some understanding and context. The if you do static analysis tools, the the popular ones are Fortified, Check Marks, IBM has a product. All those like in in the hands of a of an unwashed and unclean person will <laughs> completely create a, just a bunch of false positives and garbage. So the tuning part's important. Um, they're getting easier. I mean, like, like again, the 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 the, the, the that we work with will say, wait, wait a second, I don't have time to make my developer security get person too. So the trend is to, like I said, is to take some of the testing and bake it into the pipelines, or to make it so much easier that it happens behind the scenes. The developers, if anything, get a uh, to-do in their issue tracker, their JIRA instance or something that says, hey, fix security flaw. They're less onus on them to find the security flaw because that's a little trickier. And the other thing is when we run these tools the first time, the false positives are off the charts. So like that's one, that's like a, a maxim or a you know core thought about app security. Don't run a tool and give the verbose raw results to your developers. They will they will mutiny. So what we do is we take those 8,000 vulnerabilities and take them down to like 100, and then we validate those and we say, okay, look, about 70 of these are information leakage, they're lows. Here's about another 20 that are, you know, you look at, oh gosh, here's three or four that are actually legitimately scary as heck. All right, now we, we've been talking about serious stuff. Uh, and, and for those of you just tuning in, we're, uh, we're actually interviewing John Dixon, principal at the Denim Group. And we've been talking about the the code review, the, the development security, and a lot of the different things that are out there in our threat landscape. But I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about something fun, which uh, I know we've, we've run into you at a couple of conferences over the years. Oh. And uh, you guys are, are, are sort of known for your T-shirts, uh, which, yeah. you know, at conferences you get a ton of shirts. So if you stand out, that's a, a pretty pretty significant thing. So uh, what I thought was interesting is, is one of the shirts that I had seen said, no purchasing authority. And yes. I, you know, I, I, it's, I thought it was pretty funny. I didn't realize that came from you guys. Well, let me let me state uh, go on the record and say they're all tasteful because my mom will probably watch this podcast at some point. Uh, but they're all they're all kind of poking fun. They're inside baseball things, poking fun, are poking fun at the 
over the topness of uh, pitches that you hear at RSA or Black Hat. And I, you know, this prompted me, what inspired me about four or five years ago to do that t-shirt originally was I walked by a booth at RSA and I heard a, like a really junior salesperson say, it's not about the security of the network anymore. It's about network security. And I, <laughs> I was like, I do one of these. I did. I was like walking by. I was like, whoa, whoa what, what did you just, what, what did you just say? So I did this T-shirt a little bit on a lark, and and it was really meant to not. Uh, it was meant to tell other vendors. Because I'm irony. I was, I'm a vendor, right? I'm a vendor. Like I just let everybody know that. But uh, it was like, look, man, don't waste your pitch on me. I have no purchase authority. And so I did that t-shirt. I had no idea that it would resonate with the CISOs and security people. So it, it kind of took off. You'll see it again at Black Hat. I did the last year, the Huawei US monitoring team, US network monitoring team. And I have a fun one that's coming out. And I don't want to release it yet, but I have one coming out in Black Hat that'll be good. And if you're out of Black Hat, uh, you follow me on Twitter, it'll come out August 5th, whatever that Monday is. So, you know, I kind of want one of those no purchasing authorities. That way, when I show up to car lots, I can also <laughs> wear that shirt and it works that's there, it, right? It. Like you got to read the sign guy. At, I don't have any yeah. purchasing authority. I'm just looking at a car lot. They don't care. As long as you're wearing shoes, they'll give you credit. <laughs> this is that's true. Right. This that's is right. True. That's right. That, that, I don't think uh, it's context. And I'll send you all afterwards a, a blog post I wrote, but it, was, it ended up being funny and people took pictures and it was like totally unexpected, totally like it was a, a little bit of a tongue in cheek joke that became a little bit of a, but it's all mo making fun of the over the top kind of, uh, you know, commercial thing that RSA has been. My first RSA I think was 98 or 99 and I've been to Black Hat since about that time too. You know, I'm a very serious student of security, but this part has just gotten so much over the top. And as a matter of fact, last uh, this past RSA, I did a peer-to-peer -peer discussion on AI, machine learning, and how to uh, identify vendor pitches that are, you know, like to, the, you know, does does the vendor really have ML that works? And so uh, I do believe that, you know, I call them cyber carpetbaggers, you know, which resonates for people in the South. But I, I view those that have been in the space for a long time as uh, credible and peers, and then there's a lot of other people here too. <laughs> yeah, you know, we've we've actually seen it at RSA where uh, I used to really enjoy going to the the area where they had the startups. Right, you'd go and you'd see yeah. companies that were coming up with new creative ideas, and then I think it was two years ago that I went and got kind of frustrated because the the startup area, it was probably half of them were pushing some kind of threat feed service because that was the buzzword of the of the year. And, you know, now it's all machine learning. It's like they yeah, just gravitate uh, from buzzword to buzzword. And most I, them... I sincerely believe we're at the precipice of another correction, market correction. Uh, I, when I go to, you know, I've been in the space for a long time, like y'all. I go to RSA and see a 20 by 20, not a booth. It's an, it's a, it's an own country. It has its own zip code. <laughs> And I don't even know who they are or what space they're in. Like, I've never – and so I think there's more money chasing ideas right now. And I think there's this – you know, basically RSA and Black Hat have become this great wealth tra transfer mechanism between VC and private equity firms on one end. The companies and the medium for that is the, the, these events where they're just like the, – the, the amount of money spent now is ridiculous. It would be more efficient – if like Kleiner Perkins and some BlackRock would just give money directly to the, the trade shows instead of through the vehicles of the company. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, I get what you're saying because I've seen the, the two-story booths, right, where they have like <laughs> uh, in the uh, Trend Micro. And, you know, I actually like Trend Micro, but their their booth is this massive spaceship. I mean, like you actually walk through this thing. It It's some big money, just, just the, the transportation cost alone of getting it there. I, I think I did 27 mi miles on the Fitbit last year. So I was like tracking that. And uh, I always like walking by the China, like the Huawei booth and seeing everybody kind of like walk around it. <laughs> there's, there's always some fun, uh, fun stuff. I found a, a couple of companies this year that had um, almost the same names of companies across from each other. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> wow, that's funny. Oops, a little awkward there. So, so yeah. I do have to ask, though, since, uh, you know, you, you do some code reviews, you and your team. And, you know, we hear about AI and ML. D 
does AI and ML in software just mean more if statements? Is that usually what it means, or is it, <laughs> or is good. it actual? That's good. That's good. Because uh, it seems like <laughs> it's it all seems BS. like that might be what it is. In a note of seriousness, I I do think uh, you know that's a humbling moment for those in the industry. Like you got to go back to school and learn machine learning. You got to go back in school uh, to school and learn blockchain. And that that was one of the, the the outcomes that came from the RSA thing. It's just the learning curve issues, and uh, it's not a panacea. You know, regular monitoring and regular stuff. There's a lot of value. Don't throw out what you're doing now. But there is some promise here or there, and the challenge is is like, are you smart enough? to identify those, pro- those, those areas to, to attack. Now, you, you said a, a keyword, a trigger word for me there, which was, was blockchain. Um, are, are, you, are you actually seeing companies make productive use out of blockchain, or is that just something that's in the works for people? What, it's what, in the bowels. It's like, it's like it, ultimately, it's something that you don't even know is in there. It's just like, here's the function. It just happens behind the scenes. Like, but, so uh, what I meant about blockchain and AI specifically, and probably DevOps in there too, is there's just a learning curve for people that have been in the business for you know 20 years. The reward for being very technical and learn, lifelong uh, career of learning is you get to learn more. It's, it's as if the way that I explain it to my friends is imagine if you were a lawyer and case law and statutory law changed every three years. If you were a accountant in GAP or you know generally accepted accounting principles just turned over like like think about it. I mean, like the iOS issues, the issues around ransomware, you go back three or four years ago, they were simply not a core issue or something that we worried about. And and now it's like, wow, it's just, it's it's like spy versus spy. I feel I've got to read, you know, two or three hours a day just to be, uh, you know, fluent. And, you know, I, I always get the you know, calls from our PR company. They're like, oh, what's your take on the so-and-so breach? And I was like, what breach? <laughs> yeah, it was like, the breach of the day. <laughs> you know, this actually throws back to, to something you said earlier. You know, a, a lot of people were like, oh, we don't have time to make our developers more conscious of this. And we're seeing some more exploits. Even if that's the case, I, maybe I have a little bit different view on this. But sometimes just that, that constant prodding or the, hey, just let's take SQL injection or any type of injection attack. That is something that burgeons forth from, oh, I learned how to do this where you smash two strings together. I need to do a SQL query where I have the ID from the URL. And you do it innocuously, but if it was just that moment where you go, hey, that's user input, you shouldn't trust it, right? Just yeah. kind of poking at it. Do you, I, how does that play out? Like, is it, Would that really make an impact, or am I just being delusional? Uh, first of all, the turnover in dev is breathtaking. So like every year, maybe 20% to 25 or 30%, depending on where you're at. So whatever training effort you did last year may simply be ephemeral because it's a different dev team. Or So that's that's the starting point, is just the churn on the dev team. Uh, but what I've seen is, uh, is moving away from like the monolithic training, certainly classroom training, or the really long e-learning CBTs that are like essentially glorified PowerPoints to more topical, more related to current events. The stuff I've seen the best in, uh, is like, hey, you saw what happened over here to Equifax. Here's why it's relevant to us, and here's what you can do. That gets people's attention. Five-minute snippets. Uh, what the, uh, the I forget her name, the, the lady at Snapchat that does their awareness stuff forever was fantastic, and they did some pretty cool stuff. The, the, and the, the funny thing is uh, I did a... Uh, a major media summit in Hollywood one time about security folks. And all the studios there said, we don't use any of your awareness or training stuff from your stuff because the production quality is so bad. We have to do it all in-house because I can't really get, even our own developers are really good in creative types. So that's part of the problem. It's a tough, tough job to do. Uh, The people that do it are probably closet marketing people that are doing security and they're really good at taking advantage of stuff and most people aren't. Well, it's certainly a uh, a problem that's not going away. That you know, a lot of a lot of people jumping in and offering solutions and stuff. And I and we, we've talked a bit about the denim group and how you guys can help companies. But uh, if people want to learn more, if they want to reach out and contact you and, and possibly engage with the denim group, what's the best place for them to go to? We have this thing now called the World Wide Web. Uh, <laughs> 
www.denimgroup.com. Uh, our ThreadFix IT, that's our, our product, and those are the like starting points. Both of them have really good uh, learning sections. So, you know, part of what we do is educate and proselytize. And then my Twitter handle is at John B. Dixon, and, uh, you know, we're always out there. So I think uh, the missionary selling, the proselytizing around AppSec is, is almost a full-time job. I do think things are getting better, candidly. But there, we do have our bad days and our good days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, John, I really appreciate you spending the time to do an interview with us today. And I, I know the viewers do, too. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule for us. My pleasure. And uh, thank you for your hospitality. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen out there in TV land, thank you all for watching. But don't go anywhere because we've got more Technado coming up next. I'm James Packer. I'm the general manager of Kirk ISS based in the Cayman Islands. I used IT Pro TV extensively in my last place. It grew very well, it helped upskill the team. I had 110 engineers in the field and we had dozens of IT Pro accounts with the guys training. And last year alone, they passed over 40 certs by using the online training. I think I can safely say um, without IT Pro TV, I wouldn't be where I was today because I only got this job on the back of the qualifications I have. Welcome back to Technado, everybody. Hopefully you enjoyed that interview with John. Uh, you know, he's just a great guy and a, a great sense of humor. So I, I was glad he could take the time to talk with all of us. And, uh, you know, we learned a thing or two, didn't we, Justin? Well, we did. I could contribute. I was happy about that. It was security focused and I could still contribute. Uh, there, Don, you and I didn't play this week, but there was definitely, for those of you out there playing buzzword bingo, there were some buzzwords in there. Oh, yeah. uh, I was like, oh, there it is, there it is. It's like a pot of and gold. We, we figured we would, we'd have a stay on it since Peter wasn't able to join us. And, you know, we don't want to leave him out of things like that. Um, but it was pretty fun. He was a pretty amicable guy, you know, easy to talk to, um, but does seem very passionate about um, their undertakings there. All right, well, let's, uh, let's move on to one little uh, sort of news article, I guess, uh, that, that we want to talk about. Uh, I think most everybody knows that Technado is brought to you by the fine folks over at IT Pro TV. It's their online training uh, content and, and just engaging way of learning that helps provide the money that pays for the lights that are above my head here and the cameras in front of me and the people that help, like Justin and Megan and Brad and Peter and everybody else. So uh, uh, we're always appreciative to them. Uh, over at IT Pro TV, if you're on their mailing list, you might have already seen this. They have been doing a bit of a research study, reaching out to CIOs and other IT leaders. Uh, so they reach out to over 100 different IT leaders to find out uh, a little bit about what's going on in their world to help make sure their training was pointing in the right direction. Uh, so they've got the results on all of that, and they've kind of prepared a report. Uh, so basically, uh, they partnered with Pulse Research. They reached out to 100 IT leaders, and their main thing was asking them on how they felt their company was prepared to deal with um, IT in general and specifically InfoSec, right, information security and you know, what they were up against in today's current time frame. Uh, a lot of really cool results came out of it. You'll want to take a look at the report, but uh, a couple of the highlights, they said that uh, four out of five IT leaders uh, feel that one of their biggest threats that they're constantly challenged by are their IT employees leaving for other opportunities. You know, the IT job market is hot. And so when you get a, we call them unicorns, right? An employee that's like really good at what they do and, and can communicate and can, can behave themselves, right? <laughs> that uh, those are people that are highly sought after. And so it's hard to invest in an employee and then have them jump over to work at another company, but it happens all the time. Uh, only one in five felt that they had a formalized ongoing IT training program in place. So they're not training employees. And some of them are citing a reason for that as being, well, I don't want to train somebody so they can go and get their next job. Uh, and so they kind of set themselves up for failure. Uh, they also found that 33% of IT leaders are pen testing at the recommended cadence of quarterly uh, or, or more frequently. You know, they say at least every three months you should be pen testing. Uh, only 33% of IT leaders said they are doing that. So most people have certain weaknesses that are, are really in need to be addressed. So really cool stuff. If you want to see that full report, it is available for free. You just have to jump over to go.itpro.tv slash infosec dash report. So go.itpro.tv slash infosec dash report. You can jump right over there and it is available for download and you can read all the other things they found out from these IT leaders. Really good stuff to have there. 
And, uh, and I know, Justin, uh, you know, we, we worry about you jumping ship and going somewhere else. No, who am I kidding? Just, <laughs> With stuck. all those felonies <laughs> I have, uh, I, again, I'm oh, joking. Good, good point. We can just use the metadata from your cell phone. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> to, to frame me for a variety of crimes that just are coincidentally <laughs> occurring. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one of those cash 22 things. If I don't train my employees, then they're probably going to leave because they're dissatisfied. But if I do train them, then they might have a skill set that they could use to leave. I don't know if there's a good answer there, but I will say for me, if, if I was running a company, I would want the best, the brightest, and I, if you needed to help them do that, that would be important because it's just going to make your company stronger, even if they do decide to go leave. Um, so that's my take on it. Yeah, I, I had an IT manager years ago. Uh, we, were t- we were setting up a training budget for our company, and uh, I, was, I was trying to minimize the costs. And he said uh, that he, he was okay spending a little more. And the, the saying he threw out was, if – if you think education is expensive, you should try ignorance. And especially in the world of IT, when you hear about like like Lake City, where they probably save some money on training, they probably save some money on backup strategies, but they got hit by ransomware and now they're paying out a ransom. So that's the kind of thing you can avoid. Getting educated is the way to do that. A good IT pro is always learning. That's another saying uh, we stole from someone else. So, <laughs> so you know, always want to look for that. But I think that's about all we have for Technado this week. If Peter were here, I'm sure he would say things like, be sure to share Technado with your friends. Let other people know. Subscribe to us in iTunes, Hubcast, Spot, Tip, something. I, I don't know what <laughs> you, our podcast is. You, you know, is. Don and I are definitely not those people. Yep, uh, Facebook us, tweet rate us, like us, poke. Yeah. Do, you, do you still Lo- poke? I don't know if you poke people Link us? Is um, it link- linkedin us? I, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Just, do all those things. Just get us out there. I mean, we... We like to have we like to think we have fun here at Technado. Uh, definitely don't play buzzword bingo on your drive to work. Um, <laughs> that, that way we're not responsible for that. But yeah, let your friends know. Join us over here. It'll be a great num, great great deal of fun. Yep. Instagram, uh, Pinterest, MySpace, Friendster, you name it. Napster. Yeah. <laughs> we, we like our podcast on Napster. It'll be awesome. Do all those things. We appreciate it. Peter appreciates it as well. Uh, and. If you know somebody who'd be a great interview guest here on our podcast, we'd love to have people. We'd love to have them here in studio if they're in the Florida area, or we can remote Skype people in through our crazy Skype appliance that we have. Uh, so shoot us an email, info at technado.com, or interview. Actually, that one's even better. Interviews at technado.com, because that goes to our scheduling coordinator. Uh, and so we can line that up. Uh, or if there's some area, topic, or whatever that you want us to cover, just share it with us. We'd love to hear from all of our viewers out there. But I think that's going to be a wrap for us this week. Thank you for watching. Signing off for Technado, I've been Don Pizzette. And I'm Justin Dennison. We'll see you next time.